Hey guys, Michael from 90 Plus Camps at. Let's have a look at interpreting some quotes from this set on cancel culture. All right, so prompt one, there are risks to shutting down opinions we disagree with. As always, I am assuming that the person who's saying this has some kind of authority to say it uh, and that this isn't just a uh, here and there platitude, but that someone uh, you know has said this with some uh, deeper understanding. Uh, behind it. So always trying to have a sense of respect for whoever it was that said it. I mean, in my experience with Asa, there is almost always uh, something underneath it when we look. So let's have a look. There are risks to shutting down opinions we disagree with. So I'm asking in what sense could this be true? In other words, what are the risks or what do I think this person thinks the risks are? Um, okay, so if I scan, I suppose that uh, the only way, I mean, it's implied by us disagreeing uh, with an opinion, uh, that it's incongruent with our worldview. And so if our worldview is to ever change, expand, grow, or improve, it's necessary that it will need to interface with uh, opinions we disagree with. And we are uh, precluding ourselves or insulating ourselves from the possibility of doing that by shutting down people we disagree with. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, I think that it's probably not interpersonally productive or socially productive. So we're required, particularly in a world that uh, emphasizes economic pro productivity, to relate to others uh, uh, in work environments or just personal environments in ways that uh, are productive and people generally uh, like to feel heard and acknowledged for their opinions. So if for no other reason, just practically, uh, there's a benefit to <clears throat> uh, to hearing out and, and not shutting down people because I think it's socially productive and that allows us to um, better participate and function uh, in work or, or personal environments. Um, uh, okay. So the net where my mind just went there is, okay, so I think I've identified a sufficient amount of risks. What else might this be getting at? There are risks to shutting down. I mean, in a literal sense, the statement as a whole is true, but I'm always, I'm never trying to look at just things simply. I'm always looking to go a bit deeper. So what else? There are risks to shutting down opinion. So I, I guess it's implying that there's some other way to do it, um, which would be, I mean, in an obvious sense, not shutting down people. But is, is it more than that? Is it is it accommodating or being interested in or curious about what other people might have to say. I, I think that's what this is gesturing at. I'll move on from here, but I think that, that uh, in order to score the best in this prompt, you're going to need to not only identify the risks, but go into um, the benefits of, or, or what an alternate way of approaching the situation is beyond just the literal not shutting people down. So in this case, being accommodating and curious about other, other perspectives. Cancel culture is a beneficial and necessary part of modern media. Okay. It encourages accountability and growth for those who are called out. So I, I want to assess and understand the first bit before I move on to the second. Obviously, they're identifying, the person who said this, that, that this is a reason, but I'm wondering if there's more than this. So uh, is it beneficial, uh, more than the first part? Uh, cancel culture is a beneficial and necessary part of modern media. Okay. So I think cancel culture operates quite pervasively and strongly to regulate spaces, uh, to make them, uh, I was going to say safe and inclusive. Hmm. Let's say safe and inclusive for marginalised people. I think they're, they're, they're not very safe and inclusive at all for the people that are cancelled, but uh, for marginalised people, definitely. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think they encourage a broad spectrum of uh, debate and participation in online forums. Uh, and perhaps this goes some way to mitigating the what's called the tyranny of the majority. So in a democracy, a representative democracy, uh, uh, democracy cares not necessarily, it's, it's not, well, people sometimes interpret that word to just mean fair. It, 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 democracy has no issue with a minority getting voted out. As long as the majority is voting against them, then, you know, it, it's necessary in a democracy, someone's going to lose. And and you need to acquiesce to that, which was the issue with Trump not uh, saying that he would leave the White House if he got voted out. That's very problematic in a democracy. Uh, but it does create what's called tyranny of the majority, which is to say, if you are in a minority, too bad. Uh, whereas cancer culture here, I think, aims to amplify the voices of minorities. Um, okay, so I think that's the, I, I've got enough there. Um, because we're always, we, we don't want to depend on the stimulus material. We're always trying to go a little bit deeper. We're always trying to look past the stimulus material. Um uh, and if you want to know why, uh, if you seek out perhaps the ACT scaling test, um, <clears throat> uh, maybe I can put it on the Discord. 
in any case, it's a test administrated by ACER. And, and at the bottom of it, Mr. Doug McCurry from ACER very kindly lays out what the, the weakest middle range and top answers uh, consist of in, in the written section. Uh, and he says that dependence on the stimulus material is a, a feature of the weakest answers. And as we kind of progress through to stronger answers, uh, um, it's the ability to see the issues uh, and have insight into the issues and go beyond the stimulus material to have independent thought. And so that's what we're trying to do. Let's do it this uh, second part. It encourages accountability and growth for those who are called out. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, uh, beyond just accepting that at face value, I think I'd also point out that it necessitates um, perhaps the emotional intelligence, uh, gracefulness and balance to take on uh, the advice uh, of those calling somebody out. So th I think it's probably easy for people to be, if, you know, or, or typical even of humans, uh, when uh, you criticize them to to not be receptive to that. Um, but if someone can cannot do that, then yeah, sure, growth. Um, and, and perhaps if they continue to resist, perhaps it more than encourages, it forces in some sense. All right, quote three, we must push back against pushback. <clears throat> when only one view is allowed, it promotes not critical inquiry, but orthodoxy. We must push back against pushback. Okay, so this is pretty much an opposite of the quote before. When only one view is allowed, it promotes not critical inquiry. So what I hear out of that is almost like a muffling or a dampening or a muzzling of the kind of um, discourse that, that creates growth. I think... <clears throat> Uh, the issue here is in promoting one assailable matter of fact way that the world is and and no latitude for um, stumbling in, in the interest of discovering that, it creates almost a silent adherence to uh, what Uwe Porkerson uh, called in uh, their book Plastic Words. Uh, uh, a, a plastic word. Now, let me see if I can find that book. Two moments. Can I pause? No. Uh, there we go. All right. Uh, this is from... Uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read uh, something to you. Uh, the gods in the world of modernity are legion, which is to say many. And to mention some of the more important ones would be to list the defining myths and ideologies of our time. Freedom, equality, evolution, progress, science, medicine, nationalism, socialism, democracy, Marxism. Perhaps the most dangerous of gods are those that are the most difficult to recognise. They have innocuous names like care, communication, consumption, development, education, standard of living, model, planning, production, service, system, welfare. Those who do not think that these words play the role of God should take a look at the book Plastic Words by Uwe Porkerson. The word subtitle is more instructive, the tyranny of a modular language. As Porkson points out, these tyrannical words, I'm paraphrasing here, um, uh, as Porkson points out, these tyrannical words have at least 30 common characteristics. The most important is that they have no definition, though they do have an aura of goodness and beneficence about them. In linguistic terms, this is to say they have many connotations, but no denotation. There is no such thing as care or welfare or standard of living, but the words suggest many good things to most people. They are abstract terms that seem to be scientific, so they carry an aura of authority in a world in which science is one of the most important gods. Each of them turns something indefinable into a limitless ideal and awakens endless needs. Once the needs are awakened, they seem to be self-evident and quickly turn into necessities. Those who speak on behalf of the plastic words gain power and prestige, for they represent science, freedom and progress. As a result, dissenting voices are ignored and marginalised, since we imagine only a complete idiot would object to care and development. Everyone must follow those whose only concern is to care for us and help us develop. Each of the plastic words make other words appear backward and out of date. We can be proud of worshipping these gods, and all of our friends and colleagues will consider us enlightened when we recite the proper litanies in praise of them. I think what's uh, being got at here is <clears throat> uh, that, let's take the word inclusivity. What does that actually mean? Um, so we have, for example, just as a matter of uh, uh, contemporary affairs, uh, a, a, a child that I read about, uh, I'm not sure if I'd use the word child, uh, 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 someone uh, at... Melbourne grammar that identifies as a cat and the school lets them. I'm not giving a personal opinion on that. All I'm pointing out is that what inclusivity means today isn't what it meant 10 years ago. And uh, when these words and the gods that we're praying to aren't tethered uh, and grounded in something that is unmoving and consistent and eternal, uh, it creates uh, the need for adherence to a shifting ideal. Um, 
modernity has no positive ideals of its own, nowhere that we're necessarily going to. Uh, we're, we're more or less just kind of groping around getting as far away from religion as we possibly can. So I think that's that's some of what this prompt is getting at. I'm not saying any of those are my personal opinions, simply that that's what I think this person is getting at. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, when we don't have uh, uh, an ability for critical inquiry, when when other views accept the, the gods uh, of science and of inclusivity and of progression and all that, um, uh, it's almost, uh, what's that word? Um, oh, the words escaped me. When, when you talk out against a king, uh, or, or a church, it's a crime and it's called, it's escaped me. But in any case, it's almost like that now. Um, so there's no room for critical inquiry, uh, but there's just an orthodoxy of opinion. Uh, and, and I think that uh, this person disagrees with that. And, and we need to explore in this prompt, what is uh, the, the dangerousness uh, or maybe not that word, what is the cost of an orthodoxy? Um, and what might be the benefit of uh, uh uh, a greater um, ability for critical inquiry without repercussion. Uh, I think, for example, if I'm casting around at a reason, it might promote um, better understanding <clears throat> uh, and better latitude for understanding and growth and compassion uh, and community. Uh, but these are sensitive issues, and of course, I, I, it's entirely possible that I know nothing whatsoever. So. Uh, let's move on to <laughs> from four. Being consistently outraged by opposing viewpoints provides a ready reason not to consider them. Hmm. So again, I think this is similar to three in the sense that it it it, uh, it, it uh, entails a sense of outrage. Um, uh, being consistently outraged uh, by opposing viewpoints provides a ready reason not to consider them. So I, I think you know, there's the literal sense in which this person's saying that the motivation for outrage is simply that you don't have to. But I think that that. Uh, it doesn't miss the point, but it <clears throat> it overly simplifies the point. Um, I think a consequence of outrage is that you don't consider other opinions. And I think uh, uh, if we go back to prompt one, uh, what's the cost of that? Uh, well, there's perhaps less social productivity uh, and less of an opportunity to expand and grow our own worldview. 